Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of The Late Drop presented by Future Fins. I've been riding futures for over a decade now, and trust me, when you only have a set of fins in the water uh, from failure to success on a 50 foot wave, you want the best fins in the business, and that's futures. If Twiggy, Greg Long, Shane Dorian, and guys like Ian Walsh are using them, you know you can trust them. So please go out and support futures because they support us. And today on the podcast, I have none other than the OG, Tony Meniz. Uh, we had a great chat. We talked everything from family, uh, his special relationship with Brock Little and Waimea. Uh, we speak about the 1990 um, Eddie Aikau Invitational, the famous huge giant day and everything in between. So I had an amazing time chatting to Tony. So I hope you enjoy the podcast. I always get the first wave. Pretty much, I it brought me to tears, like the wave was so good. That's the biggest drop I've ever taken in my life. And so right there, I told myself I needed to just relax and stay calm, that I'm stronger than this. All right, perfect. Tony Meniz, welcome to The Late Drop. And we finally get to sit down after we had some miscommunications, some technical difficulties, but it's all worthwhile. So welcome, mate. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked to have you on the show. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I was looking forward to, on, you know, being on the show and just chatting and catching up in this pandemic uh, times. So yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's uh, we are we are living in weird times, and I, I, I've been, uh, you know, talking to a, a lot of different crew. Uh, you know, a lot of people that are sort of sort of surfers that are still surfing right now in big waves and. But the beauty about this is that I'm going to be able to talk to legends like yourself and and go back in time to the originators and the people that um, we all looked up to and we watched on you know on the videos and TVs and and that's the beauty of being able to do these things like the podcast. You know, it's it's I'm so stoked that I'm going to be able to you know talk to guys like yourself and uh, and it was finally I just I was doing a little bit of research on yourself, trying to get a few facts here and there. And I ended up finding myself watching um, the 1990 Eddie um, and I actually found it online. But I've actually got the funnily enough, I got the VHS video. That was the one of the first surf movies I got at Christmas back in 1990. My brother got Kelly Slater black and white and I got the Quicksilver in memory of Eddie Aikau. And I don't know if that was a sign of things to come. But uh, I just had a quick reboot of that video, and um, wow, that was an incredible year, that 1990. <laughs> yeah, it was just fun memories when I, you know, look back and think about it. And it's also super fun to watch what you guys are doing, where big wave surfing has gone. And I look at all the with technology and being able to chase, you know, waves, big waves all over the world. It's a yeah. dream come true and and in my in my peak of it all i always wanted to surf a hundred foot wave and i knew that mm. wave wasn't here at waimea uh, not even out on outer reefs i thought Kauai would be the spot at, at outside of hanalei kings you know mm. peahi came a little bit later as far as my peaking of my career when they started toying into it and Laird and the boys just always, you know, let's go. We got this wave it was kind of secret and, and Double D would, you know, push me. And, and right about then I had, you know, one, two, three, four, five kids in a row. And I was, you know, even with uh, at Mavericks, Jeff Clark was getting boards from, from us in uh, Locomotion where I was handling all the surfboard production for the team and, kind of transitioning my career and, and managing the surf team there. And Jeffy was coming over and offering me to, hey, come surf this wave and shoot photos. My timing never, ever panned out for me. So yeah. I, I missed a lot, but now I get to, you know, surf it here, watching you guys and, you know, where those times where I miss, there's no regret. I had a family. I had to take responsibility, and now I'm watching them, you know, step it up and and serve. Yeah. 
Yeah, but, and, um, and yeah. like I guess moving, moving like that. That's all. We'll move back in time a little bit because you you do have a, you have a, a amazing family. It's um, one of the f- most famous surfing families in the world, I think, and especially in Hawaii. And uh, did you was, when you were growing up? Did you have a big family as well? Did, was that something that you always aspire to have a big family? Like, were you part of a big family growing up in Hawaii? Yeah, our generation, most of the locals, you know, an average of four kids in a family was pretty average going up to seven, eight, nine, and in, in the 60s and, you know, that generation there. It was big, even even my father's generation. So lots of aunties and uncles, you know, in the different islands. My mom, my mom is from Molokai, and so I have a lot of history there on Molokai, and and my dad, my dad is from Oahu. He's Portuguese, Hawaiian Portuguese. And he always told me, hey, you know, you know, the Portuguese size, if you do research, we we're from the Azores. That's where my ancestors came from. And so that puts me Hawaiian Portuguese as a typical mix throughout my generation. If you at school or what have you, all my friends. Hawaiian, Portuguese, Chinese. I got a little bit of English blood um, somewhere in there. Um, one of the missionaries got in. But <laughs> 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 uh, all good. Um, with with that said, um, you know I pooed way on the Hawaiian side. If you were to break it down in percentages, I'm like sixty seven percent. I was told after doing my genealogy and back sixty seven percent Hawaiian. Blah blah blah. A little Portuguese and some Chinese, and but yeah, the families are always big. We we one half of the family came from the ocean, the other half of the family was in the mountain. Mm. You know, so my Portuguese side was was ocean and and mountain. In other words, my dad was the horse guy. He he loved going to to Malka. He he rode dirt bikes early on. Yeah. And that's how I got into dirt bikes. His brothers was the more water guys. And that's where I went surfing with the uncles at a very, very young age, you know, and that became kind of my, my secret hideout, like having my, my blanket and my pillow and my, my, my haven. That's where I always felt comfortable and ran to. It didn't matter what sport I got into which I did quite a few sports growing up in that generation, you know, and, and your, your junior high days, we it was normal to play basketball, football, baseball, but surfing was always there from the age of, you know, the beginning, four, three, four years old. I was in Waikiki and playing on that beach. And I always remembered uncle Duke, uncle Duke, you know, as a, little child and that that name and his image and who he represented it got ingrained in me in my brain yeah. without ever getting to hug him kiss him shake his hand yet i was a little grom he passed when i was seven years old I was running around that area you know right in the vicinity where i'd be able to that was my hero um without even saying it to anyone i just looked up to him so it's interesting how something like that can affect uh, a little child, a boy, you know, up into to all my surfing career it was like, I got to, you know, share what Uncle Duke did, you know? Yeah, I have the passion yeah. of surfing. The law of spirit is, is important and be good to people, love what you do and just share it, you know? The only thing I regret what Uncle Duke did is he took surfing about 20 years too soon to Australia. <laughs> he did he did and it was it was um it was 19 1915 or 1916 i'm I, correct this one of those two years and it was um there's a statue of the duke at freshwater beach um in right. sydney right next to manly it's a big statue right. of the duke and he went and he introduced surfing to australia and um yeah probably the worst thing that he ever done was let those australians <laughs> Get a hold of that and, and just migrate around the whole world. <laughs> you guys would have done it anyway. You guys are just born, bred, DNA, water people. So anyway, yeah, um, but, wasn't, but it, yeah. isn't I think isn't that great? The Duke, you know, like to have, 
like a he, he is like a mythical mythical character that was a, a live person he's this you know to this day he's he's so celebrated and he's so respected and um you know it was just his birthday not long ago the duke's fest would have been on um not long yeah. ago they got always in the summer they have the duke's waterman of the year you know all that stuff is still so and you know to a degree i think that for uh say someone like in my generation like even though i'm from australia i would say that eddie i cow was is like the modern day duke i don't know if that's like as in like people looking up to someone like eddie you know like he was such a famous mm-hmm. lifeguard. He he was the first Wyoming lifeguard. He saved all these lives. He was the big wave surfer, the guardian of the bay, and and then he went on the Hokule the Leu and and sacrificed his life to try and save everyone on that boat. And he became that modern day hero. And then the contest came along, and everyone wanted to be in the Eddie and want to be like Eddie. It feels like that I don't know that he's like the modern the modern day you know, version of the Duke in, in a way. I hope I'm not sure. disrespecting the Duke and saying that, but that's sort of what it no. feels like. No, you know, absolutely. I, I looked up to, those are the generations ahead of me that I look towards as a as a young Grom, you know, and a teenager into my teen. And, and it was Jose Angel, Eddie, you know, Greg No, and a whole other names of guys that I looked to. And I looked at the boards there surfing, um, and I was like, wow, these are the pioneers, the brave men that just had passion. And that inspired me a lot, uh, being born and raised in town, surfing Waikiki. You know, we didn't, it, it was a trek to go out to the North Shore. And the only way to go to the North Shore is with, with the bigger boys, you know? Yeah. Uh, kind of with yeah. the uncles. They were five years older than me going to the North Shore, you know, who want to go? I want to go, okay, if you're going to come, no matter what the waves are doing, you have to paddle out. That was, the pressure was always thrown over. And if you don't paddle yeah. out, you know, you're, you're going to find your way home. We're not taking you home. So it was like, oh, okay, where are we surfing? We don't know, probably even to sunset, you know. But anyway, um, yeah, I my dream was to get invited to the Eddie Invitational. That was part of my dream that yeah. was before before ASP, um, IPS even, International Professional Surfing yeah. that came in. I was like, man, I just want to get into Eddie. How do I get there? What do I do? And Ben Ipo was a big help to me then, you know, um, kind of mentoring me on giving me some good advice and direction and making me boards and that. And, you know, how do I get in? What do I do? Surf big yeah. waves. Yeah. Then say, yeah. Surf, Be out there. I mean, surf, sunset, and that's pretty much it. So your resume is in the water, you know, let people see you and, you know, build a reputation. And so I did. I I, I had some stepping stones from, you know, Waikiki to Ala Moana to, and Kaiser Bowes. And next thing you know, you're. Mm jumping in on the 55 Chevy, pitching in for some gas and going to the North Shore. And yeah. uh, you know, it was just in me that I didn't know, take wanting to um, surfing big waves. You know, I, mm. I, I, I wanted it, but there was fear. You know, you go, at, you go at the big boys in the car and they're like throwing all this, this peer pressure in you, you're gonna go out and surf. And I guess it helped, you know, I don't yeah. every single time. Yeah. So let, let's throw back a little bit to like, because you, you know, you said you started to surf at five, and then I, I did read um, that fourteen that you won the state, the state titles, and then you quit, like uh, basically a year afterwards, and got into motocross. Is that is that right? Yeah. So I was in the mix of sports throughout my childhood. I my mom pretty much dad was in on it made me play all the team sports baseball football you know regular american football yeah. and basketball it was the three basic sports going in school and any time before that in between that i surfed the weekends after the after the games i surfed so surfing was always the you know my comfort pillow and and i started competing 
at a young age. I think I was like nine. Yeah, I was would have been about nine. And all of our cousins and family and, you know, and at that time, Michael Ho and uh, the Blairs, their families were helping with the with the Hossa events and running Hossa events, which I didn't really understand at the time. That was all, you know, uncle and auntie. I just went and, you know, entered events. Um, yeah, so I got I got going in that, and you know, coming from a big family, I was the youngest of the boys by a year or two. All my cousins, and I was always the last kid in line to get a surfboard. You know, I would get the hand me downs, and when we would compete, I would always have the used board. It was very hard, and I said to myself, "I'm going to beat." Inside of me, I would say, "I'm going to beat yeah. you guys." I'm going to beat you guys. My dream was to get get a new board and then get sponsored. Well, cousins, brothers would have all the nice boards, and I would always come up on top. You yeah. Know? And results always come out. So I kind of fought. It made me push, you know, and out of, you know, two handfuls of cousins plus some, you know, I was the only one that went into professional side of surfing and big wave surfing, like my blood cousins and family. I just had that yeah. in me. They got, you know, distracted and did other stuff. And, and I just kept staying with these sports. I never veered off to, uh, for say anything else, but played in sports. I was always after motocross, let's go. And when I quit, it was... I was crossing the finish line. You're paddling across the finish line. The judging telling me a score. And, you know, I was like loving that. Yeah. There's there is no something way. about, there is something Love. about that competition where, yeah, there is no one telling you that you won or you lost. It's you start and you finish. And then it, I always would tell people about the Molokai was like that. You're, you're a bit of an artist, right? Because you start and you finish and in between that start and finish point doesn't mean you have to go straight. It means you can zig and zag and you can, you know, like do whatever you want in between that start and finish line. And that's where you get to be an artist. That's where you get to draw your Picasso, right? And, and, yeah. and do what you do. And I feel like that's what drew me too to the, to those the paddleboard races was that if you worked really hard, you dedicated yourself, you were committed, and you generally the best person on the day one. You know, like it wasn't it wasn't as if yes, yeah, so you got the best wave and did the best turns, and you like you see in judging all the time, and all of a sudden they got underscored and you lost, and you're like, what 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 was that? You know, you you finish first, you win. There's no if buts about it. And that's what I loved about when I started racing at age nine as well. I was racing, you know, motocross on mini bikes and, and competing. And I just got a kind of got burnt out on competing or the judging thing. I was like kind of over it. And at 14, I said, I'm done. I'm just going to race. I, I, you know, almost thought I was going to be a professional motocross guy. My dad wanted me to, but he didn't push me in either way, either sport, enough to go do the motor thing. Sometimes when I look back, I go, dang, I wish I went. I wish. Yeah. And it, it was right at the burnout crossroad of my life doing motocross and free surfing. I was free surfing. I never stopped surfing, but I would surf yeah. when I like, how I want, and it was always to feel good, get in the water after school, have time. And boxing was always in the mix as well. I did get into boxing. But, um, yeah, so at the crossroad of my life, coming back to what am I going to do with how I'm going to make, you know, I go to college. I know that was out the window after I graduated from high school, joined the military. I was this close, like literally go back there and swear in. I visited the recruiting office had to fill out some papers I needed to swear in now. And as, <laughs> if I go on to this, it's kind of the, my two, it was myself, another Hawaiian friend, and a, a local Filipino boy. So it's the Hawaiian, the Portuguese, Portuguese was me, the Moniz, and the Hawaiian. <laughs> and we all were gonna join 
uh, what do you call, we were going to join the military, which is at that time was like, okay, how am I going to make, you know, just going down this path. And the Marines was the service we were going to go into, the hardest core one. Yeah. Do the yeah. Marines. We can do so we were supposed to show up at the office and um, we were all supposed to meet the Hawaiian boy. <laughs> my buddy, my mate was lived down the road from me. He came to my house and I hope you don't mind me sharing this. We, we nah, nah, go ahead. Life. This was, this was, I wouldn't have been in the Eddie. I wouldn't have been in the Duke classic. I wouldn't have gone around the world had I chose this decision and went down there and sweared in. So the Hawaiian came by, saved my life. We sit down in my at my house before we needed to go there and meet together and go, yes, we're in, and lit up a fat one. <laughs> <laughs> he lit up a fat one, and he looked over at me, and he goes, man, man, let's just have burn a fat one, man. You know, we're, I'm not going to have this. We go to mainland. They don't have, and, you know, let's just do this one more time. And so he looked over at me five minutes later, and he's like, Hey, I'm not going, meaning, hey, I'm not going to go. <laughs> I laughed at him. I'm like, you got to be bleep, bleep, effing kidding yeah. me, dog. We have to go because our other man is, our other mate is there. George is there, man. We can't back on our words. He looked at me, took another big hit, and went, no, I'm not going. <laughs> I sat there, paused for about 15 minutes, and made a decision, okay, I'm staying home too. So interesting. Yeah. yeah. Decisions. Crazy. Made. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that crossroad led me to still figuring things out. And then surfing was look at Michael. They're traveling the world. Look at Dane. Look at Buzzy. Look at, you know, Hans Hiedemann. I didn't see him growing up, you know, really competing much when we were young, but he was around there. Um, all these guys and the Reno Avalara and the guys going around the world and, I'm at a, I'm a, you know, 18, 19 years old going, man, I could do that. So yeah. I still got this all the time. So I just went for it. You know, long story on that, I, I decided to make that my career. And it was a grovel and it was sacrifice, but it was more passion. You know, the day I got the call, hey, man, you're in the Duke Classic. It was almost like I, that goal, that box checked off did it the last four years, competed in it, I could have quit, you know, competing right there. And yeah. had the opportunity from there to travel a little bit more on a shoestring budget, you know, not yeah. like all the kids travel yeah. today. I, I couldn't take, you couldn't put a price tag on, on what I've, my experience in life, going to Australia the first year, not even knowing where I'm gonna stay, you know, my friend and I would, would go to the rent -a -rec and use car dealers and, and look to buy, purchase a car and drive around all of Australia, Bells, Sydney, yeah. and we would do the drive. I was pretty decent enough mechanic, you know, and enough confidence now I can fix stuff, so let's let's do this. Budget-wise, it was the best way for us to have transportation. Yeah. Literally, drive ourselves to the airport, right, when it was time to go home, and just leave the car. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Jump on the plane. <laughs> so, so that, so that, so you're, you know, you, you say you're about 18 years old, you, that life changing decision from your friend. Uh, and then you, around mm -hmm. that time too, is you were doing the golden gloves boxing as well. You were right into boxing. your boxing. Yeah. 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 I, I, I actually stopped when I started boxing. I, it was the Rocky in, in my brain. I stopped doing any kind of partying and I was never a partier, but I got, you know, I, I little stuff like that. And anyway, I went into three years of boxing of just going for it. And all it took is, okay, one session back in the water after getting punched in the head for, <laughs> for a lot of rounds and I said nah. and I knew boxing wasn't going to be my profession but I did it it was a crossroad of my life and it was challenging and I love that that you know I guess that endorphins you know that action in me and my my spirit man loved that and it was where I grew up to had a lot of that kind of environment yeah you had to protect, you know? 
Yeah, so it seems like the one. Yeah, yeah that seems like the one cool. thing the one thing that you have in common with a lot of people that I speak to, obviously, is that it's it's nearly like we have that that gene, you know. Because you speak about you know the surfing, then you speak about your motocross, you know, the boxing, and then even wanting to go and join the Marines. You know, there's one thing about all those things that's common is that that's all high high adrenaline, high risk you know, gets the blood going, you know, and it, se it seemed like you were just trying to find at that time of your life, which one do I choose? You know, you've got a, a bunch of these things I'm pretty good at and I can potentially be professional and maybe a few of these things and, and the ocean for some, for some, well, not for some reason, it's, it's obvious that there's a draw, it's a draw to the ocean, a draw to the water. And especially for someone like you that, that has Hawaiian blood and, and when you said Portuguese, you know, the Portuguese were amazing seafarers and sailors as yeah. well. They, I think it's underrated how, you know, they have a they had a massive, in the history of the world, they had a massive sailing fleets and they yes. were really, um, you know, they were, they were a, a reckoning to be, a force to be reckoned with, you know, back in the, back, way back when, you know. So to have that mix in you, you know, the, I think the ocean was naturally going to pull you in its direction. Matter of fact, in the Azores, they have a port there that's called the Moniz Port. So oh, my wow. boys, uh, Steph and Josh, yeah, they got a, the opportunity to travel to Portugal and the Azores. And, and you know, the announcers or guys would talk about it, that, hey, Moniz Port. And that's what my dad was saying, that our side of the Portuguese came from the Azores, the water bin, water people. Yes, it's deep in the blood. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And so when so when you start traveling to Australia and all this, like, are you, is that are you like around twenty years old? Because I'm trying to piece together like you start to you focus on surfing. You're you're at that age. You start traveling now. Have you got sponsors at this stage that are and you're seeing you're seeing a pathway like looking at you know seeing Michael Ho, the Ho brothers, and Hederman and Buzzy, and you're seeing these opportunities that all these other guys have. Do you? Do you jump on that or are you just doing it to get sponsored or at, at this time are you sponsored and you start to really you know push that way? Yeah, good question. I was working, I, uh, I worked in the city and county after that, in that crossroad time, did odd jobs, you know, and got in the city and county, good benefits, good security, you know, you can retire, got everything there for you my dad helped me get a position in there i did that for three years yeah i did it for three years 18 19 20 something like that and and um that opened up the whole picture of what my future would look like when i looked over the other side of the truck that i was sitting at and then i look in the offices and i just saw that that supervisor that foreman that's my future right there i'm going to be there and 20 mm -hmm. years later i go man i said man no I, I i i cannot i can't stay here for 20 20 years more so i decided in my heart i'm gonna try and be a pro surfer and i called my dad from the city and county yard one day came in and I just called him and said, Hey, how's was a pops, you know, just want to throw this out and see what you think. I said, man, you think I'll be able to take a leave of absence? If it's that, is this something reasonable to ask my bosses if I can leave for three years and maybe have a job? If, if, <laughs> if this doesn't work out, he, he didn't, I didn't tell him what yet. He goes, well, what are you going to do? And I, I go, I said, wow, oh, I want to, you know, I want to try and surf on this circuit. I want to surf professionally. So I did not have sponsors. I just had passion. That was just yeah. my will. I just wanted to go. I, 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 this wasn't my future here, you know, in here. And he, I thought I was going to be the old school answer. Are you out of your mind? You got security there, medical benefits, retirement. I thought he would kind of erupt a little bit. But that wouldn't have stopped me. But my dad gave me the best advice. He goes, hey, man, you're still young. And I'm on the phone. He goes, follow your heart. Whatever you want to do. The job, yeah. If, even if they don't give you the job back, you can come back and work, find somewhere. If it doesn't work, he goes, follow your heart. And I was just so relieved, you know, not yeah. having that, that friction. 
that same day, I talked to the foreman and he set me up with the supervisor and the supervisor just kind of giggled a little bit because, you know, if I'm going to go to have, get an education, go to military, maybe three years I'm asking. <laughs> a three-year yeah. vacation, can I go back and have this position? <laughs> it's hard to feel. <laughs> so he just kind of giggled and said, no, nah, man, but, you know, go do your thing and never know. Something would open up. You come back. We're, you know, we know you. And so I went. I, I bought my ticket. I sold my truck. I stayed in Australia in 1980 for two, two and a half months. And then I, at the time, was helping me with boards. See, I did all these other sports over here in my early teens. And Ben was always there. And I came, hey, Ben, get boards. And he started getting some boards for me. Um, a surf shop called Surfline, a retail store. They had helped me with boards. Just a couple boards. We didn't have like all the kids have now. Hey, here's two yeah. boards, you know. you know. And so Ben was a big help. He was going to Australia. He said, hey, man get a ticket come down there we'll try and get you in the stubbies pro and blah 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 and i sold my truck bought a ticket had i think eighteen hundred dollars in my pocket and i went stayed there for two and a half months ben wow. stayed for stubbies he went home and i just fell in you know dane was there and just kind of organically hooked up with the boys and went down to bell's beach got to meet maurice cole and maurice yeah. helped us out with accommodations with a friend and and became, you know, just networking with friends and people till this day, you know, you have yeah. friends from all over the world. And that was the start. And I never stopped. Although that year, it was like, you know, culture shock for me, trying to adjust with different waves, climate, food. And I just was loving it. Came back home broke. You know, I had a hundred bucks in my pocket, but fair enough. I lived at home, my parents and the local style that, hey, you know, Go home. I didn't have to. I knew I had roof over my head, and I just kind of groveled to the next event and the next event. And finally, I started getting some results, or just started. Just things started to happen when you follow your passion. Hmm. Locomotion picked me up <clears throat> in '82. Um, hotline wetsuits from Japan. It was timing was everything, you know. With sponsorship, I was able to pick up little sponsors here to get tickets and next thing you know, I'm on contract with Logo Motion and with Hotline Wetsuits and Mango. I don't you remember Mango. Yeah, yeah, Mango. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I I had I had a decent run one year in, in Australia and Mango put together a team and, and you know Billabong was pretty hot then. Yeah, they were the they were here. Mango got in and I was on a team with Barton Lynch, your to your foil partner. Yeah. Yeah, Martin. We had Nick Wood, we had Mark Richards, Glenn Rawlings, myself for Hawaii, and that was the team. And it was kind of handpicked when, um, yeah, when they approached me, I was like speechless. Like, you won a big lottery. You mm. know, helped me out financially to travel. It's like, yes, I'm in. So that was. That was part of the big, you know, all through the 80s, you know, I ran with it and, and never stopped to this day, I guess, having my kids you know, where they're at. Yeah. And that all happened with the kids supernaturally. I mean, it was just fun memories when I think of the guinea pig, I'll call it the guinea pig years of competitive surfing. You know, we, you know, it was like, okay, top four waves to the beach, this grovel, 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 wake, whack, wake, whack. And you know, the Hawaiians are known more for power, and it was kind of a stigma there. I grew up in town, and I was known as a big wave surfer because, you know, I did the big wave thing, but I surfed a lot of small waves. So it's almost yeah. in my brain. It's funny how the brain works. It's almost in my brain. A lot of times I go out when it's small, I go, man, like this guy's going to judge me different because, you know, they call me the big wave rider, but I can surf small waves. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, it was... Nothing, I uh, regret nothing. I'll do it all over again. You know, all the peaks and valleys, the ups and downs, the, the thrills of traveling and experience of sleeping on beaches in the car parks yeah. and all that. I, you know, this Seth making the, the CT for 2019. So we go to Snapper. It's like, okay, man, we're going to Snapper. And I haven't been back there for many, many years. I've been to Sydney with them and doing some of the QSs. 
But we're up there on, I think, on the 100th floor up there, the penthouse, 30-something floors up, looking down at Snapper. In that there's the car parks. I, I get up there, and he's got, you know, extravagant room for everybody. It's his first event. He wanted a big, big for, yeah. you know, all, all of his support. And I looked down there, just got there. I'm looking downstairs, and I saw myself. In a in a Holden wagon, down there, sleeping in that little station wagon. I said, "Sir, yeah, thank you for bringing me back here." So I want you to look down there. I go, "That's where I parked my little station wagon with Uncle Kelvin and slept, and had bread and cheese and whatever you know meat we could find from the butcher, and that's that's all we did." Man. Yeah. yeah. Crazy, and full, how full circle it goes, right? Yeah. yeah. So then when did you, Tony, when, when through that stage were you really uh, getting into the big wave stuff? Like when did, when did it click that you saw like that was a lot of value to be sponsored as a big wave guy? And when, like, when was it that, because you know when you get addicted, you can't miss a swell. Like you got to jump in that car with all your boys and drive out to the North Shore and surf Waimea or Big Sunset. Like, when, when, when did that really lock into your brain that that's what you really, really loved? I think as most big wave surfers, it, it's in you from a real young age. For me, mm. it was always kind of a secret thing. But being a townie or a guy in Waikiki, I never really shared it. So I did all these other sports, and, and I always wanted to, to, to charge. I always wanted it. But when it clicked is in 79 ish, you know, I was still, I was still in that crossroads of my life, you know, working, you know, full time surfing whenever I can. I always wanted to get the big waves. I didn't have boards. I used mm. to borrow board. You know, who has a big board I can use? We didn't have much. Ben gave me a couple boards and then Ben said, Hey, I'm going to make you your first, your, uh, your first wine mail board. I want to shape you one. And that was end of 79 going into spring of 1980. That was the time. Went in a shaping room. And I spent a lot of time in shaping rooms with, with shapers over my career. Then cutting it out right there, hand shaping it, single fin, 9-2, full rail, Locked in right there. Moved to the North Shore the next the next season. Stayed out there, um, and then traveled a little bit. Came back to town. I was always back and forth. But the winter time, yeah. I would stay out there. You know, five months. Yeah. Get a room, get someone, and just grovel. Yeah. So I I knew early on, but we didn't know the technology of of chasing storms. It nah. was just like wake up, look, smell the ocean, trade winds. You know, the local paper had some some maps up there. They, they they had some of it, but you know, hey Bernie, what's the swell doing? Bernie Baker, you know, yep. or you'd hear the reports and go, Oh yeah, it's trade winds, okay, hoping for you know, the, the little piece of information we had in the advertiser paper was like, Okay, it's sixteen seconds northwest. Big swell, you know, it's fifteen feet. That's what they would show, the post. And that yeah. was it. And there's a lot of times I would, um, you know, go out to Phantoms alone. I used to love Phantoms and just go out. Just It's like it's big, paddle. I remember yeah. my mad days, you know, when it's like 15, 15, 18 foot, occasionally 20 foot. It's like it's a super good time to break into it with nobody coming out for hours. You go out there and surf four hours by yourself, no one out. Hey, Dane, hey, Louie, hey, trying to call it, you know. You know, you're at the house dialing. Hey, yeah. Of course, cell phone. One pick up. Okay, I, I'm gonna go out, man. And I do you, just do you remember? Do you, do you remember your first time surfing at Waimea? Yeah, I do. I do. It, because as a kid from Waikiki Beach, yeah, going to Waimea was like a big deal. Are you insane? It big. It was big for me. It was like, oh. And I, I was on a borrowed surfboard, single fin, you know, and I don't think I even had a leash to go out on, a proper leash. It was hard finding proper leashes. When I got my first my man board from, from Ben, it was like, can you custom make me a 10-foot leash, you know? 
pretty <laughs> leaves. That was pretty. That was like the cups just started to come in uh, on on the tail of the board. We used to drill yep. in our fin and you know rip the tail off from its strings and that. So, and it felt kind of horrible having that leash there. That's you know under your foot. It was kind of not comfortable. But yeah, I got clear memories on that first time, and I was hooked. I was hooked. Yeah, I was just tasting. And Sunset, Sunset White Man Pipe was my favorite. I love pipe. If I, I surf pipe more than any other spots, but I always surf Sunset a lot. Yeah. But pipe was inside of me like, oh, you know, it's right there. It's here. Sunset was the challenge, you know. And who was, who, who were your sparring partners? You know, like there's such a. There's such a rich history, you know, when I, when I was looking at that, Eddie, just the names and we've gone over a bunch, but like, who is, who is the pushing you? Like, who are you out there sort of like, you know, that competing within the lineup or in the water, like wanting to get a bigger wave and go deeper? Like, who are those guys for you? Like in that, in those prominent years, like trying to prove yourself. Dane was huge. Dane Kellogg was huge. He took me under my wings the first year I went to. Australia and just said, Hey man, come here. And Dane was, you know, Dane the was there. He was the man. And I was like, you know, I started to compete before Dane as a, as an amateur surfer. Dane was playing football growing up. He was a good football player. And he, he, his story was, man, I used to look, watch you and Michael compete. And, you know, I wasn't really surfing. He wasn't really surfing yet. His brother, mm -hmm. Michael De Aloha was all time pipe surfer. But so Dane became my guy. And from a distance, I had guys that I looked up to. I had to look yeah. at. And, and those guys were really the pioneers, you know, looking at Eddie, looking at Jose Angel, that big guys that were surfing big waves. And when I looked at Sunset, you had, you had a lot of guys out there that was just charging, you know, the list of names go on off the top of my head. You know, Ken Bradshaw was strongly with a name out there, but they weren't the guys pushing me in a sense of, hey, come. Dane was a mm. guy that, man, let's do this together, man. Let's do this. And so I would go out there and I would tell myself, I'm going, I'm going bigger and deeper every time from the other sports I did, racing, motocross, boxing, growing up in an environment where, where I grew up was pretty rough running the projects. And I was like, I'm going to kick your ass. I'm going to do better than you. I'm going to, I'm, I'm here to, you know, prove to myself. It was all personal, but they, they motivated me without even having to say, Hey man, do this, do that. I, cause I wanted it as a passion. Yeah. Yeah. So I thank all the guys. I became good friends with all the, all the surfers in, in the seventies, sixties, seventies, you know, and the ones, all of us in the eighties, I'll be considered that eighties generation. Jerry yeah. Lopez, you know, I looked up to Jerry. He grew up in this neighborhood where I'm at now on the southeast side in Aina Haina. And Barry Kainapuni, BK, you know, grew up in Kapahulu and Surfboard Shaper. Lightning boats were, it was the candy store for me to go to and look at surfboards. So, yeah, everyone outside, including Uncle Duke, was a big impression on my heart of surfing. Yeah, I mean, the, the the list of names that come out of those generations that you talk about us are, are such beloved characters still to this day. They're still some of the greats, the all-time greats of surfing to this day. So what an amazing time to be a surfer and to be surfing the North Shore. Like I probably, you know, what's, what's weird and, and sad and funny at the same time is that right now, I guess, like seeing how many people are out here on the North shore on the beach is probably what it was like back then for you guys, you know, because it's, there's just not many around at the moment, you know, in the water surfing. Yes. The, they, they get some people, but if you're just walking around on, on the beach and just training and looking around, it's very, very quiet. It's like a really weird, eerie feeling, you know, that there's not too many people like around. Yeah, it, it really is. And the crowds is the eerie feeling. How crowded it is. It's so crowded and, with Maya. You know, I forgot to mention Buttons, Mark Lydell, Larry Berderman, mm. all these guys in town. Those are my peers. They were a huge influence with me, but I never really got into it. They're my friends. Buttons, Mark, 
Larry, all these guys grew up around Waikiki and Ala Moana Bo. And I was in the mix with all of that. But I never got involved with a lot of the stuff they did, you know. Mm. A lot of the, the, all the stuff they did. I just always was in and out playing sports. But they're huge influences on my life wanting to go and take this professionally. You know, Reno Avalara, Roy Russell, and the, the names go go on. A lot of, un, you know, guys with, there's so much talent in Hawaii, man. There's yeah. so much talent. What's, yeah, um, so the Duke, so, so, sorry, the Duke, was the Duke at that stage the the marquee event? Um, that was the event to get into? Like when you, it's like sort of like the Eddie now, right? Is, is, is that correct sad. to say? I was sad when when they changed that and they, you know, Quick was quick to defeat it. Go, hey, we're going to market this, you know, with Eddie and do a memorial, Eddie Akal Memorial event. When that got announced, that No More Dude, oh, man, it was like, I I hurt inside. I was like, man, not the same for me, you know, because as a young man growing up, young surfer, I, I, that was my dream to get into Duke. I was fortunate enough to do the last four events of it. Yeah. So, but the Eddie. And what, year, what, what, what years were they, Tony? What were the last four years that the Duke ran? It would have been 84, 3, and 2. Yeah. 2, 3, and Cause, two, cause, uh, 1, 2, 4. Yeah. And then the first, the first 80, year. 80 was 85, was it? The first year for the 80 was 85, Sunset. 84. Yeah. It was Sunset. The, it was a uh, mobile. Denton, 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 Denton Marriott, yeah. Denton won. Yeah, Denton right. was super good, talented surfer, did, did part of the tour. I went, nah, this is not for me. You know, went on to get married and, and work. Denton. Were you were you invited to the first Eddie? I was because I, wow. what they did was they looked at they looked at the list on on the Duke list and it was pretty much okay. They transferred a lot of the names from Duke, so I was fortunate, you know. And timing, timing was there. I was you know okay, I'm in. And if I wasn't in, oh, well, I'm going to have to work my way in. But it didn't matter to me. I was going to get in one way or the other because I'm going to go and catch the biggest wave. I just knew that. I had that in me. I wanted to catch a hundred foot wave. I didn't know where it yeah. was. Like I said earlier, I thought it would have been Kauai at Kings. And uh, Titus would have said to me, he goes, yeah, man, there's a hundred foot wave out there. Be insane, mm. but, you know. One year they caught off the eddy. I, I was I kind of knew they were going to call it off. And I went to Hanalei and Kings, we went out to Hanalei. I had, Took, I, I took my three boards that I had with a couple friends. A friend picked me up, went out to Hanalei. Hanalei started peaking, and queens and kings started to break. And a near drowning experience then that I had surfing Hanalei at, you know, when it's that big, you're like, okay, it's 15, okay, 18 foot Hanalei. It's just Richard Schmidt, myself, two local boys, and that's it, and great training freight training one of the memories i go uh and kings yeah. when you saw king break out there you're like oh shit. we got a huge foul. sets coming <laughs> but i never got to go out there you know you know there's no way i'm gonna paddle for honolay to king but oh, oh, we didn't have the skis we didn't have enough yeah you know, time boats yeah. but point was i always wanted to catch a big waves and i admire you guys all the big surf that's happening and i get jealous sometimes on all the big surf that that's happening right yeah. now where I go, man, I can't, no, I can't do it. I just can't. I'm 60 years old. I'm just too <laughs> old now. <it's> over. <laughs> but I surf here when I see it. I go, wow, man, I can feel it. I love that part of surfing. Oh, 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 sorry. That's all right. Uh, so what's, um, what's, uh, was, you know, when you said you always wanted to go, you know, obviously bigger and, and that hundred foot wave, what was did was there a stage where Waimea sort of got stagnant in in a sense where you're like, man, we've surf, I've surfed it um, like a ton of times at this size. Like I'm, I'm starting to like think outside the box. Where else can we go? 
you know, start looking at the outer reefs, you know, uh, on the North Shore too, because they, you know, can get quite big as well. Yeah, yeah, and and for sure, I, 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 um, that definitely came in. I was like, man, it's it's definitely not at Waimea. I respect Waimea. I love Waimea. It's helped me with you know, with my surfing mm -hmm. life and career. Um, I would I would go out to Phantoms quite a bit. I thought it would be Phantoms because that channel between Phantoms and Backyards, you know that that thing never closes out. It's never a wave across. So yeah. I'm like, oh man, it's gotta be, it's gotta be there. And Kimi scared me. <laughs> I paddled to Himalayas, but that that place just that place is like, uh, you can get caught so easy, right? If you mm. commit. And yeah, log cabin such a wide playing field i would go out there and maybe not you know you're hoping for the big one and waiting and trying to it was a hard one for me to catch so the one year she's they canceled the eddy you know we're on the beach they're like no it's gonna get caught off uh, who's gonna change who's gonna save the water patrol if we go out there <laughs> that was the top yeah and i believe the year that ken bradshaw caught the biggest wave recorded out at out at um he, he told yeah 98 caps. 98 yeah can i think they so called it condition black 90 1998 next time you're with brian kailana ask him about the time we surfed makaha that day i've never seen it that that big again of course i've never chased every sweater but 20 to 30 foot freight trains not a drop of water out of place perfection wow it's unbelievable the bigger that place gets the more hollow it gets and it goes right into the west bowl like it does and some of it would connect across that was a memorable time i've surfed it numerous of times like 15 18 20 foot but Waimea would be a, a, a one that on the calendar. So talking mm. about big waves, places, other places that, you know, that just puts a mark on the calendar, Rabbit Island, mm. Rabbit Island. I surf Rabbit Island, 15 to 20 foot. Paddle out, only me out by myself, my wife, at the time, I had a few kids, big northeast swell, all the northeast side out at Kahana Bay and that pumping. I'm on South Shore. I blaze over in the morning to Sandy. Sandy's is 12 plus, just perfect, crowded. I go over to Makapu. And just, just this perfect wave out there, just going, shh. It does, it looked like 10, 12 feet, kind of 8, 10, 12 foot, you're from a distance. And, you know, just head back home, grab boards, trying to look for a partner to paddle out. <clears throat> I told my wife, look, I'm going to go out, I'm going to go surf Rabbit Island. Wade was shaping my boards to coral, called Wade, he didn't answer. Okay, he's surfing out at M&M's, you know, that left yeah. out at Kahana Bay. I knew he was surfing up there. So <clears throat> I ended up going out to Rabbit Island, surfed it all day. Mike Stewart paddled out, and then one of the lifeguards came out, and we were like, I was, how big you guys think the waves are, you know? You know, lifeguard man came out and go, oh, this is 20 foot. I said, okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Just checking, it's like, you know, and perfect. Yeah, you'd ride that thing. It would do the same thing off the island, you know. Drop out a toll session at the time would have been like so magical, mm. so magical. I had an eight six, and it was I. I could have paddled in with a, a a bigger board to get to get in earlier, but you know, with the eight six, you have to kind of paddle under more and drop in, and it it just it just bounced off, wedged off the island, and went across. That day, Brock Little guys, as always, buddies with Brock, and he he said they wanted to surf that rock in front of suicides outside of in between Rabbit Island and and Makapu, 
Mm. There's a wave over there that was like mutant A frame. If you miss, you pretty much die. It's what it looked like into that flat island. Speaking of Brock, uh, I know he he was such a <laughs> such a madman, and I know he uh, rest in peace, brother. Um, I know he yeah. spent a lot of time with you, not only in the water but up in the mountains. He loved his mountain biking as well. But I want to go back to that 1990 Eddie because I, I, I rewatched some of it today, and I was saying that what Jaws has done with performance, you know, being such a long wave and and the barrel ride and even with the turns, you know, there's been a really big jump in progression with big waves and what you can do. Why Mia, to, in all fairness, is such an amazing wave, but it's sort of the drop and you sort of go into the channel and it doesn't very rarely offer a barrel, but it seemed like in 1990, you got a incredible barrel. I saw Michael Ho get one. The one that I remember Brock's telling a story. I'd love to hear your side of this where you and him on his barrel that he got, which was hands down the best barrel ever at Wyomere. And he just fell out when he got, you know, got spat out. But he was saying that he goes, him and him and my good friend, me and my good friend, Tony Meniz were pushing each other deeper and deeper and deeper. And then all of a sudden he just, when he took off, he just knifed under that thing and, and just pulled into that. It's one of the most famous waves at Wyomere in one of the most famous eddies, I think, in 1990. Yeah, um, that that heat of the moment, it was like, no, man, this is not, we're, we're, we're greedy, we want the wave. It's like, no, not too much of a friendly, yeah. You know, you have your, your meeting, pre-meeting before you battle out. It's a gentleman's rule. No, when, when, when you're out there, never. I want to get the best one. I want the inside. And one of the only ways to get barreled at Waimea, like a lot of spots, is from behind. So mm -hmm. Brock and I was pushing, and I knew that, just looking at it. It's coming off that chip shot over here, and then the flat section and the bowl, that's where you needed to try and come under and pull in. That particular wave, Brock and I push and shoving. We were the deepest in that heat, always pushing over there and kind of staying underneath. I actually had, I had him, you know, on that wave. I had my boy Brock. I'm so happy I gave it to him. That can <laughs> <carry his body. laughs> it motivated me. So I was, I was here on the inside. If you can see that, he was on top of me, right, and just begging. <laughs> he was like, "Brock, don't! We're battling up. We're." We're sliding. He goes, I got this, Ra. This, I got this. And I was giggling. I was like, oh, my foot was literally enough to push his nose. <laughs> he like, just like, no, man. Just the Kali kid in me. I'm, I'm like, oh. At the last second, I just went, go for it. Go for it. So I let him go. Came back out. He just got the ride of his life. He made my adrenaline go through the ceiling and I just looked at him and he was, he was such a, he was such a character, kind of a dick. <laughs> he said, got the right of my life, man, like cocky Brock, got the right of my life, oh yeah, blah, 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 and I'm all fun. I go, oh, you fucker, you're so lucky. And everyone's yeah. just like, uh, okay, he's like looking at me and just going, ha, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm going to go deeper and bigger. And, you know, and I had the opportunity to just pack one and I, I packed it. Single fin. It's a board that I designed with a good friend of ours, Ron Rausch. You yeah. know, we, my experience out there was like, okay, I'm looking at all these. We're like, okay, let's make some boards for the Eddie. You know, Ron's motivated. Let's, let's do some boards. I was writing a lot of Rossins before I even got my Toporos. And I was like, oh, okay, longboard blank, lower entry. I need to get in early. I need to knife one. I need to knife one. And we had the single fan that just got me in waves out there. I was like really happy. But the problem was no drive on the bottom because it had so much roll on the bottom that the entry was good. Poke, knifing the board was super good. But once I got down here, it was like hand Slow down. 
<laughs> it was like the train trying to stop. And I, I, I knew that, but I was like, nah, this is, this is kind of it. I'm going to ride this. This is the board I'm going to ride. Like if I got out more on the, not behind the peak, and if it, I could ride it, you know, and, and get in. My whole deal was I need to get in. I need to get in under. I need to do something going to let me go. Thrusters just was round, right? I mean, the thrusters wasn't round, but I didn't change it. I, I, I was like, I love the free, the feeling of just free falling with the single. I had a hard time changing for YMAO. Yeah. And I finally, I think after that year, I, I okay, bring it on, you know. So, yeah, we, so, yeah, Rock and I got a whole lot of memories riding dirt bikes. He rode his dirt bike. He went, he boxed. My dad was a, was a trainer down at the gym where we grew up. And he would, my pops would say, hey, man, your friend Brock Little, tell him to be careful. He is getting one too many punch, punches at this gym. Brock was known there to be the most, like, animal beast mode come in and want to spar they would literally um try to deny him to spar because you know he's just hey, you hurt yourself man you're not that experienced you getting punched all the time but they'll throw the gloves on he just kept coming back my dad said he got really good we'll just okay brock you're gonna spar we need sparring a punching bag here go for it and he got really good <laughs> he surfed that way he rode his dirt bike the same way up until his last ride he was pretty much on the timeline, really close to it. Called me up, you know, he's like, hey man, I'm gonna go to town, I'm gonna get some IV and come back, they take me up to the park to the ride. I was like, okay, I'm at the Billabong house, let's do this. And one of the last best memories, I think that was his second to the last or his last ride. And he's going, oh, okay, we'll ride, let's just do like some of the perimeter, a little easy, you know, I go, okay, I can follow you, I follow you. And that guy jumps on, and he just starts taking off, and we're flowing, and he's skinning bones. And mm. he's on mm. this thing, like his whole spirit, man, this is spirit being, just flowing, and I'm tripping out on him. And he comes up to this hang, and it's down in a place we call Dangy Fever. It's one of the hare and hound races, ready to drop down into Dangy Fever. And he looked at me, and I looked at him and I thought, oh, no, man, you're not going down. You're not going down there. He giggles. He goes, ah, oh, you fucker. <laughs> you know, Brock turns around, yeah. looks around, yeah. does all these little pretty insane se sections. And this one hill, he, he went up and I was like, dang, you're going to go up that thing? It wasn't that long, but it was steep. And it had, it had a step up on the top and you have to hit this thing and clear it and he looks at me like cocky brock confident crazy man and just pins it and goes right up boom you know i'm all wow this is that's good i guess i gotta do this i don't know if i would have did this today but i go up there and i i get up to the top and i launch my bike and it gets stuck right up on the tree and, and, and it's there on the tree and we're laughing, oh man, that's for you. Brock was, let's say eight years younger than I am, something like that. And he, he did exactly the stuff I did, you know? He started later in his, in his age to ride dirt bikes to box. You know, the dirt biking I did in between surf and growing up. So he always was like, man, you know, knew that I ride, and I stopped riding for a while. He was always like, let's go ride, come ride with us. So he kind of pushed me to get him back more into it. They had a crazy crew. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, Tony, about, um, you know, obviously the future, what's happening now in big wave surfing, and, um, you know, a lot has changed since you guys were doing it. You know, the one thing that I saw in the footage at Waimea is that the surfing at Waimea has what you guys are doing back then is as good, if not better, than what's happening now at that wave. I think what what's allowed us to get better is the, the waves that we have access to now and obviously some technology and stuff. But I'd love to get your thoughts on some similarities and differences from that older generation to the newer generation. I think the similarities I would call out would be 
the passion that you would see in the same uh, generation to surf big waves. There's more of the differences, there's more available. The surfboard designs has gotten better and better. Um, one big change on that is you guys put on these angel wings now. We didn't have angel wings. Yeah. <laughs> but the safety, <laughs> the safety, the safety, the safety, not knocking that, but I do at Waimea. I do at Waimea. That drives me nuts. And to see all these guys going out with floating devices, there's just too many. So it makes it easy. Yeah for a guy that's not experienced to go out because I'm going to float around and someone's going to pick me up with a jet ski that kills me. I would paddle up to Waimea some, some, some days on sizes, like just you can paddle out and catch one, but I can't because there's just way too many guys. And, you know, driving by the bay and you see this guy carrying a board and he's got, I can see having a padded vest, but when you got that and some, Pool strings, the all pool vests, yeah. And it's 50, 18 foot, 20 foot, it's why now. Yeah. I would wish that the boys would go, I know the safety, but boys would go, oh, it's not even 20 feet, or it's barely 20 feet, and no floating devices if you can't swim. You can't handle yourself, do not go out. That's my, that's yeah. the one that kind of rubs, rubs me in a way like, oh man. I guess, you know, with us going out with leashes in my generations, the pioneers would come and go, wow, that's such a sissy thing to do. You got a leash, you know, you want, you know, same, you know, it's all yeah. relevant. Um, man, just to see the, the talent pool on big wave surfing, it's very, the size is like ginormous compared to our generation. We didn't get to see it. You know, Peru with big waves, Brazil might have some waves, but we didn't get to see the amount of guys that could really surf. So there's more big waves surfers. And then there's a division between, it divides between even now, like, you know, you either have it or you don't. That's still there. That's very yeah. relevant to my generation. Not everybody wants to paddle out of that. Waimea or let alone Peahi or Mavericks or, you know, huge, yeah. uh, you know, anywhere out of reefs. This, this, the support system is huge difference. It gives confidence. So during the eddy, whenever they would have support system out there, the water patrol, I would feel like, yes. I was like, I, that confident in me was like, yeah, got the boys out. They're watching us. I'm going to just pack one i'm going I'm going of course my condition my mental health was good and I, I wanted to that was one event that i was trying so hard to win you know and anyway at podium a few times did surfed in seven of them out of the first nine i was on that invited list so just you know 20 years on the list 20 plus years on the list as soon as they put me on the alternate list, I was telling uh, the guys that quit, it was, um, what's his face? You know, George and them, I was saying, man, hey, take me off the list, put some other kid. I'm, uh, it looks like I'm going from, okay, I'm, you know, on the invitee side. No, I'm going backwards. I'm look at me, I'm gaining weight. You guys got to ask my wife if I should get in. <laughs> <laughs> that guy, a joke after a while. I'm like, ah, look at me. I'll yeah, up, but I'd rather get this to iron gold, you know, some yeah. other person that was frothing to get in their dream. I was give this guys a chance. I, I had my, yeah, I think, I think that's a, a great thing that um, a lot of the guys have done over the last years is just like, Hey, you know what? There's, there's a bunch of really talented kids and, and they feel the same way as you guys did. Like, I mean, I, I can speak for myself was, uh, I mean, when I got that video in 1990, it was just a, a dream. You sit there and go, Oh my God, like I want to do that. You know, I want to be in the eddy and you, and you know, your mum and dad look at you. I'm sitting in Australia and in a little town called Coffs Harbor. And they're like, what you want to be in the eddy? I'm like, yeah, why not? <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, it's just, but I think that, you know, especially growing up in Hawaii too, uh, the kids here that just, 
I've just seen that event and I wanted to be in that and, you know, get on the alternate list and see themselves work their way up and then get on the main list. It's such a beautiful thing and brings a community together. And there's nothing like the Eddie, like the, the one, the one that I got to surf in the Brock swell. I mean, there was just such, I mean, driving to the beach and seeing everyone and the thousands and thousands of people on the beach, you're walking down, you jump out, you can hear the crowd when a set comes. It's just, the energy was, it's, there's nothing, I've never felt anything oh. like it in my surfing life. It's so, so, it's so cool. I mean, you, every year you hope it goes. It's like you just hope that Eddie goes yeah. every year. Yeah. I was up there judging that one. They, um, yeah. So, you know, the Brock Swell, there was the year before, I think, the, when he was alive uh, that winter, he, um, he, told, he, he told the guys, hey, man, uh, I, they, Brock was going to judge, and he didn't have the energy. Yeah, and that the year they called it off was a year prior. And he said, "Hey, I want you know Tony to take my place. Hmm. I want him to take my place and and, and judge." And, and and prior to that, it was Clyde and some of the directors. Hey, you, you know we 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 got you. You know, kind of we, on the name on the list to judge. He said, "I would love to." I'd love to, and so that was in for me was special. Want to be up there and to represent Brock in that. Yeah, watching you charge and the whole crew I was like, I was psyching, you know. Yeah, once a big wave surfer, always a big wave surfer. It's just yeah. it's in your blood, and and like you say, you know, for for me, I feel even if I when you know, when there comes that time that you potentially either can't surf those waves or you, or you don't want to, and it's your choice. Like, I still feel like, you know, I, I would want to be out there on the ski or on a, in the channel or watch. It's just, there's something about it. That's just so that being in the ocean, when the, when it's that raw and powerful, there's something that draws you to it. And to, to the day I die, you know, you just, I, I, I get FOMO, you know, missing out on swells and like seeing a big swell somewhere. It's just, there's just something about it that just is so energetically amazing. You were up in the first wave with Ross Clark, right? It was you, me and Ross. Yeah, yeah, first wave, first, first wave of the day. A few waves. And yeah. I tell you what, mate, I was judging. And I was like, we were talking up there. And I said, man, guys, that's an interference. If that guy wasn't there, if Ross wasn't there, you would have been. Mm right there you were like so positioned yeah. so good and i was i was kind of bummed that yeah i mean i get they get it that the adrenaline he's going and it's like man i think it happened two or three times i got right? yeah i got twice. i got i got ross burnt me twice and twiggy burnt twice? me once so on my four waves i got i got three and three guys yeah. jumped in on me on my I, four waves yeah i was you know it's supposed to be that gentleman's room and, and and I was like, no, interference, I don't care, I'm putting that. That's an interference. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they do the replays. Like, look, we're looking at him. Like, look, come on. Guy's like going, he's not giving room. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it's, 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 but, you know, but you know, I think like, like they say, right, that Eddie picks, seems like it picks that person for that day. You know, everything goes right for that person that day. You see a lot of people that have won that event just, have said like even Ross said, himself like today that he said he won, he said just won. said that everything he went his way. Went yeah, yeah, and well deserved, you know. On the years the winners got, you know, Noah Johnson, he was charged in the year Noah won. Yeah, yeah, all all of them. Bruce yeah, Irons, uh, he won. Yeah, yeah Bruce won. Yeah, well, it's a, it's been an amazing journey, and and I think that we all um, owe you guys a, a debt of gratitude for paving the way for us guys and having such good role models to to look up to. And uh, it's it's uh, in, and now you know you get to pass that on to your kids. And congratulations on Talia. Your sister's about to have a uh, a baby. You're going to be yeah. get another another be another granddad again. <laughs> Number four, sweet. Number it's four, fun yeah. Being a I have to slap myself a couple of times when, when Micah had his first and, you know, literally I, I looked in the mirror 
and I kind of smiled at myself and I said, hey, man, talking to myself, you're a grandpa. You're a grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Life's short, man. It's like, grandpa, yeah. you're a grandpa. They call me Papa. Yeah. Pops, Papa. It's such that's, a, that's it's so such awesome. a blast being around, being around at, at this time. And um, be, um, to be honest with you, as part of a dream, as a as a dad as a father to, to to see your kids for me it was see them get out of high school maybe college get married and have grandkids and i was diagnosed with cancer mm. don't feel sorry for me about two years no. ago yeah with prostate cancer it's like uh someone having breast cancer the women saying yeah if there's any cancer wish upon yourself would be i want that one I want prostate. I'm still dealing with it, but I'm like super good. But the beginning mm. was a shocker. And so the reason I'm going there was like, man, I wanted to see this part of my life. This, you know, my grandkids and one more grandkids and almost like, oh, okay, number four is coming. Can I, you know, when I got diagnosed, it's like, am I going to be here for number four? I didn't know what, the, yeah. what it looked like. And so the good news is, I, uh, one of my reasons on canceling my my you know my eleven o'clock today would be was eleven right is yeah I double book a checkup on my prostate and so I went through uh, all the tough stages okay now I'm like just monitoring um, the blood levels and it's going down man it's down to zero point zero two well you're yeah. a fighter it's Tony point, so point I'm, zero I'm sure it's yeah, I'm sure that yeah, you're going to so, beat that. There's no no way it's going to beat you. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, and and I'm not afraid of sharing it now. Had the beginning, I hid it from my family for six months. Wow. Last year, I hid it. I hid it from them. Found out. Yeah, a year and a half it's been. A year and mm. a half, and it's doctors today was like, "Wow, man." You know, look at you. Any, you know, how's your energy level? I go my energy level. I ride my dirt bike as many times as I can. I two, three, four, five times a week. I'm on my dirt bike in the mountains, super active. I have no side effects. I'm all. I got this thing. I'm all. It's it's gone. It's like it's going. And he he's yet to read. You know, some some scores. And he goes, well, yeah, you're on your way, man. It's like you know, it's down to zero point two. You know, and I'm like, yeah, so it's, your PSA level needs to go down. So, yeah, to all of you brothers out there at, at an age, I think like at 50, do your physical now. Go check your physical. That's how I was, I found it. I was very diligent going through every year, then I faltered two years and it did my physical random. I'm like, wow, I better go, you know. I picked up a lot of weight, but I, I was like, oh, man. And that was a whole game changer, you know. It was like 205 pounds. And, and when I found out I had that, I just changed. I was, there was a lot of fear, but I'm like, what did I got to do to do this? Change your eating habit, you know, get in that ice bath at 5 in the morning. I was like diving mm. in there. My wife thought I was nuts. She didn't know I had cancer. And I was telling myself, I'm going to beat this if this thing. I don't know. I didn't do much research, but if this thing can freeze the cancer and still out it for 15 years, I'll do it. You know, so got into that mode here and it helped and here, you know, and then the eating went, I'm down at 180 pounds, which from 200, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm in almost fighting shape. It feels good, you know, like surfing, everything you do. Yeah. So I wanted to share that with you guys, you know, and be, out there no yeah. one needs to feel we got it either way i win you know with with getting the cancer my my everybody has a time and if i went tomorrow you know it's not guaranteed i, I checked a lot of boxes in my life i, I did okay mm -hmm. you know i'm going out clean you know but yeah a couple of more rides would be nice you know <laughs> a couple more ways would well be nice. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Tony, I think that's a, that's a perfect way to end the podcast. I think listen to uncle Tony, go get checked out. Um, you look, Tony, we, I think we, the surfing world loves you and your family. You guys are such great role models. Um, 
such talented kids and, and, and good kids, you know, and uh, you've done a great job raising the family. And, you know, I look, at my, I look at my kids and hope I can raise them like you've raised yours. And uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And, and I know that a lot of this younger generation that um, are going to appreciate listening to all your wisdom and all the stories that you had to tell. And uh, so thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I really enjoy it. Thank you for having me, Jamie. Thank right you, on, Tony. Mark. Yeah. A lot, a lot, brother. All the Thank best you. See out there this winter. I'll be on the beach going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>